Hey, Dodger fans, just a quick note at the beginning of this episode, Vince and I, this is Jeff, by the way, Vince and I recorded this episode Thursday night. It was supposed to be our Friday morning episode and uh, our software that we record with ate the recording. We thought it was gone forever. Well, Sunday afternoon, it was restored. And so I am uploading this Sunday night. It's kind of a bonus episode uh, or fulfilling our obligation because as you know we always talk about never missing a day we felt terrible about missing friday this is friday's episode you will still get a regular episode in your feed in just a few hours from monday morning but i wanted to get this one up now that it's available because uh i thought it was a fun episode so with that said let's jump into the episode coming up on locked on dodgers we'll take one more question from a listener about the fringe players the dodgers signed this offseason and then we'll take a seat in the owner's box and pretend where he owned the Dodgers and see what we want to do and change the franchise. That's what's on tap, so make sure to keep it locked on Dodgers. You are locked on Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yo, 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 Dodger fans, welcome to Lockdown Dodgers. We are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, the number one local sports daily podcast network. Lockdown, your team every day. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Lockdown. Make every moment more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on today to get started. This is the daily podcast covering the Los Angeles Dodgers, bringing you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue. We can be found wherever you find podcasts and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. And if you never want to miss a day, because you know we're not going to, make sure to subscribe in both of those places, and uh, that'll be taken care of. This is your first time listening or watching. Well, it's good for you because you get both of us. I'm Vince Samperio. That's my co-host, Jeff Snyder. We're both lifelong Dodger fans that currently cover the team, have covered the team for a few years, uh, moving, moving back, and have spent time in the press box and locker room. But I've also spent time all over the stadium. So we're not quite insiders, uh, but we know enough to bring you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning. And that's what we're here to do today. Although there isn't necessarily any deep dive analysis happening today that there was no real moves. No, nothing really happening in the baseball world. uh, Nothing really in Dodger land, but there was a couple of moves the other day and we had a question from listeners. So we'll get into that and then we'll, we'll take a seat in the in the owner's box and we'll we'll see what we want to make some changes to the dodgers organization uh but before all that jeff yeah we, we are uh, another week down and another week closer to spring training yeah i i'm excited it's uh you know not like spring training not like things automatically start happening but at least there's stuff to talk about and i think this spring training is going to be more interesting than most because there actually are quite a few positions being played for uh both roster spots and who's going to be starting where. And so while, uh, you know, we, we did, uh, I got a question uh, after yesterday's episode asking how much stock we put in spring training results. And I still think we need to uh, take that grain of salt with everything because spring training is spring training. Pitchers are working on things. Hitters are working on things, but I think this year we're going to, it's going to be more exciting to watch the games because you Oh, how's James Outman hitting? How's Michael Bush's defense at second base? A lot of things that, we just don't know the answer to, and it, it should be a lot of fun. Yeah, you got spring training, then you got World Baseball Classic, which we're I would imagine both excited for uh, some competitive baseball in the in the, in the month of March. So I uh, can't complain about that. Yeah, for sure. Who are you rooting for in the WBC? Uh, well, rooting for Mexico won, but they're probably not going to win. So I just root that Clayton Kershaw and Julio and anyone else of the Dodgers just doesn't get hurt. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, health of Kershaw and Julio is probably the number one thing. But uh, I, I think you got to root for the USA once Max goes out with Mookie and Kershaw. Come on, nah, I'll root. And Will for, Smith. I'm not a, you know, I'm American, but I like to be on the contrary side. So, oh, man, we'll see what happens. And you think uh, I'm bad for not liking the Bartolo Cologne worship? Yeah, you know. What happens? Um, all right. Well, today we do have a question that was sent in after Jeff's mailbag yesterday, uh, but a good question and kind of touches on a couple of signings the dogs made the other day. Uh, this one comes from the Card Maestro at the underscore Card Maestro. He says, out of all the fringe depth moves they've made this offseason, 
He lists, he lists Shelby Miller, although I think Shelby Miller is a major league deal, so it's a little bit different. Uh, Steven Duggar, Jordan Yamamoto, Bradley Zimmer, et cetera. Who do you think is going to have a breakout season a la JT, CT3, Muncy, Anderson, et cetera? The Dodgers signed Jordan Yamamoto the other day to a minor league deal. He pitched for a couple years with the Marlins, one year with the Mets. Uh, hasn't pitched very much and hasn't pitched very well in the major leagues. Although there was some people that uh, had a little bit of excitement for him. He is still just 26 years old, uh, if that means anything to you. And then the Dodgers also signed a guy named Wander Suero, who Wander Suero is a pretty unique name. That's probably why you remember him, but uh, probably not. don't remember him for much else other than that. Yeah, uh, it, it's funny that you point out that Shelby Miller was a different type of contract to those. I hadn't made that connection, but that explains why when I read this question, my answer was immediately, well, obviously Shelby Miller. Uh, because Shelby Miller, of the four guys that the Cardmeister listed, Shelby Miller is the one who's most likely to even be in the big leagues at all, let alone have any sort of breakout. Uh, Jordan Yamamoto, I... I assume his mom doesn't listen, and I'm glad because I'm about to say so. Jordan Yamamoto's mom, if you're listening, hit the 30 second skip button. I could not be less excited about Jordan Yamamoto. I think even his first six starts in his big league career when he was actually pitching well, he didn't have good stuff. He wasn't, it was always like, huh, wonder how this guy's pitching well. And then he faced the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. And and that totally like since he faced the Dodgers for the first time, his career ERA is like eight. Like he, he's just He's not a good pitcher. He's never been a good pitcher. He's never going to be a good pitcher. Uh, did I get that all in 30 seconds? Because Jordan Yamamoto's mom's skip button is almost done. Uh, so, yeah, I don't care about him. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to think about him again uh, once the season starts. Uh, Duggar and Zimmer, I think they're both behind Jason Hayward on the list of probabilities to get major league playing time, although injuries and other things could change that and uh wander swero my main thought on wander swero was i was really glad the dodgers signed him because all october i kept every time i saw ranger suarez pitching i kept trying to think who's that other guy who's the same person as ranger suarez and the answer is wander swero so now that question has been answered and now i'll probably never think about wander swero again either I wish Wander Swero was the same person as Ranger Suarez and the Dodgers had him. Cause he, well, same he, person doesn't have to be actually similar quality. You know, uh, when, when I was growing up, Reggie Jackson and Ron Jackson were the same person too because they both had the last name Jackson and played for the Angels. So, you know, it doesn't take much in my stupid brain. <laughs> it does happen. But, yeah, I mean, like I said, Shelby Miller more than likely going to be on the major league side, especially considering they didn't sign too much else in terms of bullpen help. But of all the other guys, I mean, I guess you throw Hayward in that mix because he is signed to a minor league deal. So he'd probably be one of the guys you expect to have some kind of impact. I don't know if a breakout uh, – I don't know if the breakout's the right word at Jason Hayward's age, but it could be he's still – he's not that old. He just seems like he's that old because he's been playing since he was very young and playing forever. But, yeah, um, I don't know. I don't expect any of them to have uh, any JT, CT3, Muncie type breakouts – but it would be cool if one of them did, but I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Um, I'm sure they'll all have, not maybe not all, but I'm sure Duggar and Zimmer, between Duggar, Zimmer, Hayward, either each of them or at least one of them will have a moment this season that contributes to a Dodgers win. And we can remember that and thank them for that at the end of the year after they're no longer probably on the roster. You think all three of those guys are going to get major league playing time this year? No, I said I said oh, one, one at oh, least okay. one. Okay. Yeah, up to I can three. get on board with at least one. I thought you said yeah. all three of them. Okay. Nah. Um, yeah, and, and honestly, Shelby Miller, it wouldn't shock me at all if he has kind of an Evan Phillips kind of breakout because he has good stuff. And uh, and that's the thing, you know, people when when the Dodgers signed Yamamoto, sorry, Yamamoto's mom skip again. When they signed him, and I saw people like posting a picture of Mark Pryor, like, oh, the Pryor laboratory is going to work. Like, no, Mark Pryor takes guys with good stuff and helps them refine it and use it better or takes guys with potential good for good stuff and helps them make their stuff better. You know, Yancy Almonte slider and Evan Phillips slider and you know, the, the usage and everything. Jordan Yamamoto doesn't have it, but Shelby Miller does. And, and Shelby Miller still has good stuff. And I, and I could absolutely see them turning him into a really, really good relief pitcher. I wouldn't put money on it at uh, FanDuel or anything. I don't think FanDuel has odds on that, but, uh, but I definitely wouldn't be shocked to see that. 
Yeah, FanDuel should let you submit odds that you want to create, and then like, if as long as you're going to put a certain amount of money on it. Then... Yeah, you'd have to commit to it because they'd have to put some man hours into that to because you'd have to figure out. I mean, because it's not just like a, the I'll eat my shoe thing like with Victor Gonzalez. You'd have to quantify what does a Shelby Miller break, breakout look like, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, they probably won't do that, but that's a good segue into FanDuel because – Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. The NFL playoffs are here, and we're excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because there's a number one sports book in America, FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better because they have so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. And right now you can get $150 in free bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just sign up at FanDuel.com slash Locked On. And place all your favorite bets from money line to point spreads to player props and even combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with the same game parlay. If you follow any betting accounts, you see a lot of these same game parlays where people bet like 10 things to happen in it in a game or in the span of two games. And you can turn a dollar into like 10,000 or, or five dollars into like 25,000 like people do it. So go check out FanDuel build out some parlays and, uh, you know, put a little bit of money on it and you see what happens. And if you win any, kick it back to us and we would be appreciative. So football fans, don't miss out. Place your first $5 bet to get $150 in free bets, win or lose at FanDuel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports book partner of the NFL. All right, Jeff. So we're back and we are, like I said, no real news. We answered all the questions I was submitted there isn't too much to talk about that we haven't already talked about. There's only so much we can talk about Miguel Vargas and Michael Bush and everybody else. Um, MLB Pipeline did release their top 100 prospects. The same six prospects that were on the Baseball America ones are there, plus Andy Pajes. The Dodgers had seven in this top 100. Um, but, yeah, real no real surprises there. The, the same six guys, Andy Pajes, is another rising star in the Dodgers prospect pipeline. So, um you know, maybe not this year, probably next year is where we talk about him more in depth as somebody that has a legit shot at helping out the team. But so what we're going to do is we are going to pretend that we are given the op- the chance to be owner of the Dodgers and we get to make some changes to the Dodger organization. And we're each going to give those changes that we would think of to change. And it you know can be on field, off field. We are owner of the team. I would imagine Dodger Stadium falls under that realm so if there's something to that as well and uh yeah jeff i'll I'll, uh, kick it over to you cool uh only caveat i'll add since it was my idea is these changes are permanent you know we're only owner for a day or two or whatever but the changes we make are are long lasting so it's not just something that uh that mark walter is gonna change back the next day and say ha ha uh so with that said my first change i would make and, and this one is uh kind of obvious and it's one of those things that's easy to say because it's not my money i would make it more affordable to go to dodger games and uh lowering ticket prices tying it to uh profit somehow uh as a season ticket holder the last 10 years uh my price is more than doubled on my season tickets over those 10 years and uh it it's not like the dodgers were struggling for money at that time and, and again I, i'm pretty uh, hesitant to tell people what to do with their with their own money, uh, but I believe business wise, it would be a good decision for the Dodgers to make it more affordable for families to go to Dodger games, uh, because the more kids you have in the stadium, the more kids you have growing up loving baseball, and then you know you you have a kid going to a Dodger game, and he's going to say, hey dad, for Christmas, I want a Mookie Betts jersey and a Dodger hat. And they would make up that money. The Dodgers make so much money in uh, memorabilia sales and obviously their TV deal and everything else anyway, uh, that they would make that money most likely still in increased uh, revenue from memorabilia by making it more affordable for kids who ask for things for Christmas to go to more Dodger games. And so uh, I would, uh, I don't know the exact, but I would definitely want the, uh, somehow ticket prices to be tied to uh, team profitability so that uh, they can't just, Hey, we're going to bump your prices up by 30% next year because we can. Uh, I would rather have it be tied to, you know what? We lost a little money last year, so we need to raise the ticket prices. Otherwise, you know, it's, it's, and maybe even, Hey, we made a crap load of money last year. 
ticket prices are even going to go down next year. You know, something where it's tied to profitability. Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely more expensive. I mean, secondary market on a, and not every game night you can get in a little bit cheaper, but even then, between everything that goes into it, you know, Dodger Stadium is probably one of the more expensive places. And yeah, there's a good team playing there, but that doesn't necessarily mean you know that you have to have. Like there, there's no the, those ticket packet anymore with like four tickets, four dogs, four sodas for like four. You know, obviously it wouldn't be forty-four bucks in today's day, but something like that. They replaced a lot of those midday week games or those week games, weekday games, with giveaways, and so it like keeps the ticket prices high, but it also doesn't leave affordable nights really. So, yeah, I can I tell a behind the scenes story really quick? Yeah. Uh, I, I've never told the story anywhere, but I'm going to tell you guys why I am no longer a Dodger season ticket holder. Um, I've had eight tickets for the last 10 years, the whole row. And the reason I got eight is because I have a wife and three kids and several siblings and parents who love the Dodgers. And so there are times when I want to take eight people to a game. And so I basically I thought I'm going to get a row of eight. And that way I know I always have enough tickets and, and I'll sell the ones I don't use. And, uh, the Dodgers came to me, my season ticket rep called me and said, uh, we're going to cut you down to four because you violated our policies. And I said, what policy did I violate? And she said the, the policy of uh, using the tickets to make money. And uh, for those of you who follow me on social media, you'll know that I, I actually sell my tickets uh, for quite a bit less than they would cost on the secondary market. And I think the hidden message was, that because I was selling them directly instead of selling them through StubHub, I, I think the Dodgers probably get a kickback when you sell, use their system to list them through StubHub, sell them through StubHub. And so what they were actually saying was, we're not getting enough a kickback on the tickets you're selling. And so we're going to, because I didn't sell very many more tickets. I did sell a few more in 2022 just because gas prices were so high. So I didn't make the 661 mile drive as often, uh, but I didn't sell that many more. Uh, but I think the issue was that I was selling them directly for reasonable prices instead of selling them for ridiculous prices through StubHub and letting the Dodgers get their kickback. And so that's why they kept me down to four. And I said, uh, I responded to them and told them it was ridiculous. And I told them, uh, I didn't even ask for my money back in 2020 when you canceled the season. I just let you have an interest-free loan for that year. I've been a loyal season ticket holder for 10 years. So uh, I will either keep all eight or I will keep zero. That's up to you guys. And they chose zero. Or, well, they responded by saying, our offer of four still stands. And I didn't dignify that with a response. So that is why I'm no longer a Dodger season ticket holder, because uh, they were upset that they weren't getting enough of a kickback when I was trying to sell my tickets to Dodger fans for reasonable prices. Wow. How dare you please the fans, Jeff? How I know. Dare you? I've got feelings. And that's why this was my number one pick in this particular draft. Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. And uh yeah, mine, my first move is actually something that uh, pertains to the stadium as well. And it's more so for being a big guy, but it, I think it would also benefit the Dodgers to go from, you know, 50,000 to redo everything, cut it maybe down to like 40, 45,000, make the seats a little bit bigger, a little bit more comfy and give everyone the comfort of being able to watch the game and then open up maybe a little more of those bars or the concourse, like open wide in the concourse or whatever the case is, because there are a lot of people that are there, not just to watch the game, but to socialize and treat it as a social event. And then there are people there that are there to watch the game. And I believe the people that are there to watch the game, you know, Dodger fans, uh, you know, there's a lot of guys that look like you and me that go to Dodger games and it's not necessarily always the most comfortable. And even for people that aren't, you know, that, that, that big, there's still a little bit uncomfortable. So I've always thought of that. Like if I ever owned a team or built stadium, I would like, okay, make it nice, make a little bit less seats, open up a lot more standing room or concourse area and just let people enjoy it. Cause like I ended up standing, getting there early and standing in one of the standing areas anyways, just so I have freedom to move into rain. Um, although last year I did go a lot as media. So there's, lot more room for me than that way too so yeah, yeah. I, I i don't hate that one uh i know something about the dodgers dodger stadium holding more than fifty thousand people like still makes me happy like i like that the dodgers can have fifty three thousand people at a game you know they can average i mean they averaged like fifty one thousand a game just a couple of years ago or something and so i i kind of like that i'd have a i'd have a hard time if they dropped it below fifty thousand um 
You but, can still get to 50,000, but it might not be like actual seats. It might be like 45,000 seats and then 5,000 standing room and yeah. just add more standing room area. Yeah, although also one of my main motivations to be less fat is so I can be more comfortable at Dodger games. So uh, if they just accommodate me in that, then I'll lose my motivation, Vince. <laughs> Who knows what I'll end up looking like if they make the seats bigger. Yeah, well, you never know. There's still going to be a reasonable, like, all right, you're still going to be uncomfortable if you're can't just be an amoeba and expand to fit the allotted space yeah but uh yeah so we got more coming but first uh real quick thank you for making locked on dodgers your first listen of the day every day and check out locked on mb prospects with host Lindsay crosby for your second listen of the day Lindsay crosby is a prospect encyclopedia and he's going deep on the mlb stars tomorrow it's being available wherever you get podcasts all right jeff back in it and uh back to you okay my next one Um, and this is one we've talked about in the past and, uh, it's, it, it's something that's always on my mind. I actually wrote a big long article that I'm actually, uh, working on turning it into a book right now, writing my first book about retired numbers in baseball. And, uh, I wrote this big 40,000 word uh, feature for baseball essential back in 2015 about retired numbers. And the thing that got me thinking about it at the time was, the Dodgers policy of only retiring the numbers of hall of famers. And I just, you know, I I know I just talked about last month too, with Justin Turner a month or two ago, but yeah, if I was owner of the Dodgers, I would change their policy on retired numbers. I don't know exactly what I'd change it to, you know, and what I talked about recently was saying that Justin Turner would be my baseline. You know, basically if you're Justin Turner or better, you get your number retired if you're not Justin Turner or better, you don't. And I think I feel pretty good about that because Justin Turner, you look at everybody who's been better for the Dodgers than Justin Turner was. And it's a lot of guys. You got Fernando and Oral Hershiser and Ron Say and Steve Garvey and, you know, guys whose numbers probably ought to be retired. And if you get worse than Justin Turner, then you start getting into like the Yankees retiring Paul O'Neill's number category. And like, Paul O'Neill's number being retired for any team is ridiculous. And I don't want the Dodgers to get to that point. I don't want Jock Peterson's number retired, you know, Uh, but Justin Turner spent nine years and, and, you know, and and maybe also even Turner gets extra credit for his, his impact in the community. And so maybe you have to be better than Turner on the field or Turner's level and have really, I, what I don't like is that they're outsourcing the decision to, the Baseball Writers Association of America saying, once these guys decide uh, somebody should be in the Hall of Fame, then we'll retire their number. It's like, what did Gil Hodges do in the last 50 years that made him more worthy of having his number retired just because a committee of 14 people decided that Gil Hodges is now a Hall of Famer? Gil Hodges, you know, his number should have been retired a long time ago. And and it's uh, it's silly to me that when Clayton Kershaw does retire, we're going to have to wait five years for the Dodgers to officially retire his number, even though they'll never issue it again. Clayton Kershaw, the, if he announces one year, hey, this is going to be my last season, then the last game of the season, they should put his number up on the on the wall because it's retired. It's never being worn again. And, and so, yeah, I would change the Dodgers policy on retired numbers. I don't want it to get out of hand like the, like the Yankees, but I think the Dodgers have far too storied a history to justify – only retiring the numbers of Hall of Famers. Yeah, I can, I can vouch for that. That's a that's a good one. And like I said, the Dodgers would hold a standard, a little bit different standard than some other teams have of, you know, people that actually deserve it. So yeah, makes sense. All right, uh, my next one would be to buy out Frank McCourt of the parking of parking and ever the law whatever he owns. And hire an efficiency expert to figure out a better system for getting people in. Out, getting out is going to be a mess no matter what, but getting people in and figuring that part out is something that I've kind of seen the last few years. Now, before you'd be able to go in through a certain gate and you know you get to go to a certain area and park there. And, you know, you were benefited by getting there early if you were one of those fans that gets there early. Now you get there early. You don't necessarily benefit. Sometimes you have to park even further than you would if you got there a little bit later. The parking people don't understand that it's a lot easier with these small parking spaces if they parked every other car and then let those people get out. And then you fill in the gaps after that. 
just the, the Disneyland whole, approach. Yeah, just the whole revamp of the entire system. Now that you know, like I said, getting out is always going to be a mess still. But what the Dodger could do to accommodate that is add some Wi-Fi to the parking lot because the, once you're in your car and if it's a, it's a heavy night and you're not getting out for a while, there's no service there because everyone's trying to be on their phone and you know it ends up being a mess. So you're just kind of stuck there. And yeah, that these are all first world problems for the most part, but it's also something that accommodates that that something that would lend to that. And this is supposedly was in the works before the pandemic. Not sure if it's still in the works was like, you know, having that new Dodger stadium area, the concourse, the center field, like be somewhere where you could stay after the game, hang out, you know, they'd have food or drinks or whatever the case is. And then, you know, that way might help out with that, um, which, you know, not necessarily my full idea, but that would be something. And it's kind of already in the mix. I didn't want to use it, but yeah, just kind of revamping the parking uh, to at least help out getting in and, you know, causing you to not be too crazy when you're getting out because you have something to kind of do or if you want to hang out in your car, at least you can be on your phone or, you know, that's what people do these days. And, you know, it's reasonably accommodating to do that. Yeah, they are. There's still talk of putting in like that cable car system to run from Union Station to the stadium. But even that, I think what I read, it's only a, it would only like support like 8,000 fans a game or something. So that only alleviate yeah. i mean they have those problem. shuttles but the shuttles are if you're the union station shuttles are a mess most of the time luckily i use the other shuttles those lines are never long but the union station shuttles are long so i would imagine you know even those getting into those little whatever the yeah little gondolas. i wonder if there's some sort of futuristic like uh like adding more entrances by you know like big overpass kind of things that get you hey you know we're taking you up and straight on to the five you know, not yeah. down stadium way, but that you are going up over Chinatown and on to the five. Uh, did I get my geography right? Is it Chinatown that's right between Dodger Stadium and the five right there? I think. Um, yeah, kind of. Well, the well, one or yeah. the 101. I, yeah, 101. I, uh, anyway, oh, right there. You, you get what I'm saying, you know, yeah. but like actually let's make eight more exits from the parking lot that go straight to freeways. And, uh, you know, uh, that I don't know. That would be cool. Uh, yeah, also getting in is just a mess in general like if you're not like if you're there for like bobblehead game and you're not there and at least an hour before you're waiting almost an hour just to get into the stadium so i yeah. feel like there's very much so a more efficient way to do that yeah every time my friends up here in utah go down to their first dodger game they always ask me for advice and i always tell them just so you know it's impossible to get to a dodger game on time you're either an hour early or you're an hour late so yeah. don't try to get there on time yeah. Uh, all right, my last one kind of ties back to my first one about making building the next generation of fans. And that is I would figure out a way to provide more autograph opportunities for kids before and after games. And I, I think for me, like I understand starting pitcher on game day. OK, you're exempt. But guess what? Clayton Kershaw on days you're not starting. You're, you're required to go sign autographs for 15 minutes somewhere. Every single player, you're spending 15 minutes signing autographs for kids somewhere, whether it's throughout the stadium or just on the field at different spots. But getting more chances for kids to get autographs and selfies. And I know autographs are hard because there's so many idiot parents who use their kids to go get autographs and then try to sell them. And so, you know, I, I don't know what the answer is there. And, and selfies are kind of cool that way. You know, like one of my son's favorite things is uh, back oh, the home opener of like 2014, 15, something like that. Whatever year it was that Kenley Jansen missed the beginning of the season. Um, but he was out running wind sprints on, on the warning track at the home opener. And uh, and my he just stopped and he took a selfie with my son. I, I took a picture of him and my son. And then the next year we went to FanFest and Kenley signed the picture. It got a print and he signed it. And that's hanging on my son's wall. A picture of him and Kenley Jansen signed by Kenley Jansen. That's not something that's going to get sold. That's a memory that my son has forever, you know? And I feel like there are ways to create those memories for kids. Some of my greatest memories as a kid are going out to the player's parking lot after the games and by that eight foot chain link fence and getting autographs. I remember talking to Eric Karros, his rookie year. And uh, before he won Rookie of the Year, before he was even really playing really well, but he stood there and, and signed autographs and chatted with us. I remember the time that uh, my brother still sometimes refers to himself as Pab. 
PABB stands for personal assistant to Brett Butler because he sat on my dad's shoulders and handed stuff up over the fence down to Brett Butler to sign and then got it back and handed it down to the different kids. And my brother was per the personal assistant to Brett Butler. Like those are memories that we have. And, and so like we still in my family sometimes say, Raul, please, Raul, please. Because one time Raul Mondesi came out and this kid next to us just kept saying, Raul, please, Raul, please, Raul, please. And it's like a family joke now, but there's so many memories from getting autographs at the, at the player parking lot as a kid and, uh, you know, giving kids more opportunities for that, I think would be huge for the future of Dodger baseball. Yeah. So you, you can tell think, I'm a sappy parent, huh? So you don't think charging the kids for autographs at fan fest is a great idea. Uh, well, it, I'm fine with charging, uh, parent uh, adults. Hey, honestly, it's 30 bucks per autograph, which isn't bad, um, at fan fest, but, uh, but yeah, you know, there, I, I don't think it's great. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah, my last one. I'm also I'm gonna accommodate myself as a big man again, but also just in general for the Dodgers promotions. Now the Dodgers do a lot of promotions, so I understand, I guess, from a business standpoint, why they do things the way they do. But I've also been to promotional games at some other stadiums, and it go can go either way. But I will commend the Padres for the way they do promotions because when it's a bobblehead giveaway, it's full stadium giveaway and every, you know, if you, as long as you get into the game, you get one, uh, they don't have like a 50, 40,000 cap, whatever the case is. And when they have a giveaway for clothing item, they have size small to size double XL and you, you know, it's easy. You go up and then you go pick your size. They have tables like set up and you go pick the size that you want, which the Dodgers, any giveaway with the T-shirt or anything, it's medium or XL, which, you know, for the most part, that fits probably a good amount of people, but doesn't fit a lot of different people. And I think even for the theme nights, they have medium or XL for some of this stuff. And it's like, okay, if I'm paying extra for this specific ticket for this specific theme, I should be able to get something that's in at least the size that I want if I'm a large or if I'm smaller than X, bigger than XL, smaller than a medium, like whatever the case is. Um, and just like promotions in general, I'd bring back the fleece blankets because those were some of the best promotions. And I still have some of those fleece blankets, uh, that serve many purposes, um, uh, beach towels, like that kind of stuff. So I would revamp the promotional giveaways and try to figure out, you know, way to let everybody get it because, you know, sometimes you can't get to a Wednesday night game by seven ten or by six thirty, six o'clock, depending on which bobblehead or which giveaway it is. And sometimes you are bigger than an XL and you want to wear the, the cool little giveaway the Dodgers had that night. So, yeah, uh, accommodating the big man is what I'm trying to do at Dodger Stadium. Interesting. On the bobblehead thing, I actually, the Dodgers actually do more bobbleheads and make more bobbleheads per giveaway than any other team. The Padres actually limit theirs to 35,000. Uh, the right. difference might just be that. Maybe the they angels. somewhere I went, it was every fan gets bobbled. And, and, and I, I actually did some research on this just recently. Nobody does as many. The Dodgers do forty thousand, and the Padres are the second highest at thirty-five thousand. Uh, but their their stadium doesn't hold as many as Dodger Stadium, and so. But yeah, it would be, you know, in twenty twenty, the Dodgers had some bobbleheads already made. Uh, and then the pandemic hit, so they didn't use them. And so uh, they actually, they did some of them in 2021. You remember they did that funny commercial, taking uh, the bobbleheads out, out of the uh, out of the boxes and stuff. Uh, but if you remember that year, the Justin Turner one was only 25,000. And that was because they had already given away 15,000 of them during the pandemic uh, as different giveaways. And so uh, what that what that told me was they could easily make, 53,000 of every bobblehead and then if they have you know 2,000 left over use them as special giveaways for things and, and make it so that everybody gets one uh it seems like that would alleviate a lot of headaches as far as you know I because I can't imagine it's fun for the staff uh on bobblehead days with people complaining and fighting to get to the front of the line and everything if everybody with the ticket knew I'm going to get a bobblehead you know, then yeah, okay, make fifty four thousand of them because you know that way everybody gets one, and then uh, if you have leftovers, either burn them or give them away. You know, it's it, it's not going to hurt anything. So yeah, uh, especially now that you can go in through any gate. So now, like if you get there later and people you see people 
trying to go to different gates to see which ones still have bobbleheads. Like it's just it's a lot easier to just make the they're sponsored anyway. Just tell the sponsor throw in kick in a couple extra thousand and yeah. I wonder what the bobblehead. actual cost I'm making. I assume it's like three dollars per bobblehead or something, which yeah. means adding you know it, making fifteen thousand more is real money. But is it really? You know. Again, it's it's us telling other people how they spend their money, but that's why we're owners for a day, you know. Yeah, exactly. And we would, if you, we were owners, you guys would. We wouldn't be like, uh, you know, like Artie Moreno came in lower beer prices, and then it's been a downhill ever since then. We'd be we wouldn't be like that because we were gone after two days, but our changes would stay. So, speaking of bobbleheads, I'm going to give away a bobblehead to whoever gives the best comment in YouTube on what you would. Uh, what you would do if you were owner for a day. What's your one change? I know we did three each. You only get one in the comments. Best one gets a bobblehead. I, I've got a bunch of extra bobbleheads, so we'll figure out you know, which one you get. But uh, even if you're listening on the podcast, not on YouTube, hop on YouTube and comment. Be sure to watch enough that it counts as a view because you know the point of all this is to get more views on YouTube. So uh, listen to it all the way through the podcast, of course. Listen to it in your other podcast catcher and then listen to it on your wife's phone and then go to YouTube in both of your browsers and watch the full episode. But comment and tell us what you would do if you were owner for a day and the best answer gets a ball ahead. Yeah, if you do all that, send us a screenshot and you know maybe that might help your chances i don't know absolutely <laughs> uh, the best idea is the one that gets us five views yeah so uh yeah go do all those views like jeff mentioned that's gonna do it for today's episode thank y'all for listening thank you for sticking another sticking that out another week with us we are getting closer to spring training we're getting closer here to talking about actual dodger things so that's exciting we are here every weekday morning for you. Remember, uh, thank you for listening for Locked on Dodgers. Check out Locked on MLB Prospects with host Lindsey Crosby. He's talking about the MLB stars of tomorrow. You can find us on social media, Twitter and Instagram at Locked on Dodgers. Jeff is on Twitter at Snydog. I'm at Vince Samperio. DMs are open on all those accounts. You can also get a hold of us via email, LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com or via voicemail text at 323-863-5625. We're here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be with us when you get in your car or if you're at home. Terry Smart Device Play Podcast, Locked on Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. Have a good one. We'll talk to you on Monday.